<laughs> so welcome, thank you very much. All the participants that attend the class, I know that you did an amazing job. Laura, I'm so proud of you. And thank you for all the people that are listening to the story of the holiday park. Thank you, thank you, you Marco. Thank thank you. You. So, hi everyone. Welcome, welcome. Let, oh, here, let me turn this on. Marco managed to reach you all, but there, now we've got a little more volume. Uh, welcome. We're really happy to have you join us for a celebration of storytelling. And my name is Laura Sturza. As Marco said, I am the teacher of the memoir writing class here at Holiday Park, which we call Tell Us Your Story. Because not only do people write their stories, but as you will hear today, they read their work aloud. And that's why we have this opportunity for you to hear them share their work. Uh, these these uh, brave folks, they come from a very wide range of backgrounds and experiences. You'll get to hear a little bit about that today. Uh, through creative writing exercises, through lectures, through class discussions, we also, uh, I give them take home assignments. So this is, this is a serious class. People, it's serious, but it's not serious. People work hard. They work hard. They not only get their stories on their on the page, but they go home and they work to refine those stories and edit them. And really, that's why I love that Marco introduced these folks as artists because they are indeed artists. Uh, they wrote about topics that include places that they've lived, shopping expeditions. They wrote about vacations, favorite foods. Uh, family, community, occupations, and more. And they used a lot of different techniques. So not only do they, do they write, but they, they study how to, the craft of writing. And the craft of writing includes how to put emotions into a story. So you'll hear, I'm gonna just sort of talk about some of these things. And as you're listening to the stories, you'll see how beautifully they've implemented these things that they've learned, which include uh, sensory details, how things smell and touch and taste. They talk about their feelings, how they felt about a certain situation. They write about characters in their lives. These are people that are important in their lives, and they, they use their craft to draw pictures that a reader can really enter into the story and get to know the people in their lives. Uh, they, taught, they also use a technique that is called building a dramatic arc. So when you tell a story, it's, it seems seamless, right? But what's really happening is they're using their craft to show a beginning, a middle, and an ending where the action rises, where there's a sense of drama, where there can sometimes be even a sense of tension. You don't know what's going to happen. And all of these are technical things that they have learned over the course of their eight weeks. Uh, and they also, the other thing I want to say about this group of folks that is so lovely is that they really did build uh, a little sense of community. And you may have seen some of this as I, I was scrambling around setting things up. All, all the students came up and were helping, right? And that's this sense of community that gets built. And it's really important to have that sense of community because what I want to say about these stories too, and I use the word bravery, is that it takes courage to tell your story that people are telling things that are very dear to their hearts. It doesn't mean that sometimes they're not lighthearted stories, but they're often telling things that are really from their history and their past. And so one of the things that we emphasize in class is creating a safe space to share their work. So one of the things we like to say is just like what stays in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We do the same thing in our classroom, that if someone shares a story in class, we don't talk about it outside of the class because some of the stories that we tell, we don't, they're not the ones that we're going to read aloud today. Now here, folks have signed on to perform their work publicly. So they've crafted a piece that they feel comfortable sharing with a group of folks. So that's different. But we also, as I say, within class, we create this very safe space. Uh, I also want to mention to those that are writers in hiding or writers who 
identify as writers, that this class will start up again in mid-June. So you are welcome to sign up. The class is offered for free. And it is important, too, I really need to give a shout out to the folks that sponsored this. So this course is offered for free because the Montgomery County government, through the Montgomery County Arts and Humanities Council, provided grant funding that paid for this class to take place. And so that's why this class happens for free all year long. And uh, the other co-sponsors are the folks here at Holiday Park who have, as you saw, Marco came and helped us. We've got, there's such a great team of folks working here, many volunteers and some staff workers who are paid who keep Holiday Park running. And if you're not familiar with Holiday Park, I know there's at least one person here, maybe more, who have never been to Holiday Park before. It is an absolutely amazing place with classes all day long. Many of them are free. Some are very low cost. You can take all kinds of classes here. So I just want to give that shout out to our sponsors <laughs> who helped make this wonderful uh, opportunity available to our students and to you if you would that you get to be here today and if you would like to sign on for the next series of classes so with that i will go ahead and introduce our first reader today and that is bonnie cook bonnie is a retired montgomery county public schools teacher who spent over 30 years gathering and sharing stories with each student and made sure that each of her classes, class days ended with a smile and a song. Having dedicated her life's work to helping children use their voices to tell their stories, she knows the power of the written word and continues to use it in helping children, teachers, and parents make real connections. And I'm just going to add that Bonnie has also been beautifully using her own voice in her writing. And with that, I give you Bonnie. and I have a story called Belonging to share with you. The last class of my first day in high school, the first really big public school I had ever attended. The day had been long and overwhelming. So many people, and they all seemed to know each other. I remember clomping up the high school stairs in my wooden heels, up from the gymnasium, and straight into the math hall. The bell rang, and there he stood. Tall, Ooh. silent, commanding, and looking back, I bet he even had a twinkle in his eye. Didn't see it then, but I can't remember him any other way. I do remember our first assignment. Get ourselves in alphabetical order and get the desks lined up into the four corners of the tiles on those brown school floor and get it done quickly. That might be easy if you knew the other people in the room or if you didn't mind making yourself heard, neither of which applied to me. Luckily, my family name guaranteed I would be near the front, so I knew to just wait by the door and listen. The teacher's name was Colonel Paula. He had served in Korea with some of my other teachers, and though retired from the military, there was no doubt that he was still in charge. Each day, Colonel Paula would go over the new geometry problems. There was no getting around taking your turn at explaining a problem. Although always serious, if you watched closely, you could see that Colonel Paula hadn't completely abandoned whimsy when he entered the math classroom. His high expectations and the dread of letting him down became the basis for one of my longest and closest relationships. Fortunately for both of us, Rhonda, who was right before me in the alphabet, was also new to the school district. Rhonda was tall, which gave me a place to hide. Better yet, she was good at math. Because we came from the same gym class beforehand, a day didn't go by where we didn't touch base and make sure our answers matched before we walked into geometry. The two of us made our way through ninth grade. When 10th grade began and we were no longer part of Colonel Paula's class, we decided to turn the tables a bit and see if we could brighten his day a little. One of the things we had picked up in addition to math was that Colonel Paula loved chocolate chip cookies. That's where Rhonda and I began. We would leave little messages before school meant to brighten Colonel Paula's day. We never signed our names. We just signed Chocolate Chip One, 
and chocolate chip too. I don't think we'd ever planned on revealing who we were until one day in the locker room, we overheard a cheerleader talking about Colonel Paula, chocolate chips, and how she was taking credit for his happiness. Not on our watch. <laughs> Near winter break, we slipped Colonel Paula a note asking him to meet us at a specific time in his room. We knew the cheerleader wouldn't be around. When the two of us timidly walked up to his room with a plate of cookies, it was our turn to see Colonel Paula dumbfounded. He had no idea Rhonda and I, the two nervous freshmen from last year, had been the personalities behind Chocolate Chips 1 and 2. But that was only the beginning of a great friendship. Rhonda and I knew we would always have someone to go to for help in the math hall. We both made it through high school and left not quite as timidly as we had entered. The year following our graduation, working as a substitute teacher, I found myself called to the same school to cover a math class. The wild class I could handle. The lunch in the math teacher's lounge, not so much. I remember taking the corner seat at the lunch table. When Mrs. Bumpus, who had taught me Algebra two and Trig, saw me there, she asked what I was doing in the lunchroom. This room is for teachers only. I didn't say a thing. I gathered up my lunch, stood up, and headed to the door. From the head of the table, I heard Colonel Paula calling my name. I turned around to see him gesture to a chair next to him, asking me to sit down. Thank you, Colonel Paula, was my reply. I'm not Colonel Paula anymore, Bonnie. Call me Bill. We're colleagues now. I never forgot the gift of belonging he gave me that day. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for starting us off with that beautiful story about your teacher. And this is one of the things, so, so I just want to point out some of the ways that Bonnie incorporated technique into that. You heard her use dialogue, you heard her draw characters beautifully, right? You really got to know Colonel Paula. You got to know her. The way she described how she'd hide behind her tall friend, you got to know things about her. This is all technique that she's using. And you don't realize it when you're listening to a story, but that's the hard work behind writing that it takes to weave a masterful story. So thank you again, Bonnie. And now I'm happy to introduce Anusha Fernando Dharmasarna. Oh, and a reminder, friends, if you would please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> we all have that happen. That would be terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, so Anusha, for Anusha, writing was a hobby while she worked for the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve and raised a family. Sometimes she writes poetry, sometimes she writes about the moon and the stars and butterflies that amaze her. Often her writings are inspired by life moments that teach her a lesson or two. Uh, recently, she has been documenting her ancestry for her family. She is from Sri Lanka and lives in Rockville, Maryland. And with that, I give you a new show. <clears throat> Thank you, Terry, for honoring my invitation and coming to my presentation today. And Cora, you too. Thank you. Roots. It was April 1980. The previous October was a big birthday. I turned 21. Where I come from, this was a big birth year. It's a year to begin new adventures. Tr travel to the West, get a polished Western English education, and live happily ever after. It must have been a lucky educator time, according to the Zodiac, we believe, in that I received a letter of invitation from my cousin to visit the U.S. With my mother's blessings and dad living in another world far up in the skies, I left for New York City that April to explore the amazing country with no plan 
and only $500 in my pocket. It was a make it or break it for me. My name is Anusha Fernando Damasena and I come from Sri Lanka, the resplendent isle in the Indian Ocean along the Silk Road where the Portuguese stopped in 1505 in search of spices. During their stay, they didn't simply exploit the island's resources and converted many Buddhists to Christian faith. They taught us to enjoy their cuisine. Uh, and it has been amazing uh, to see how many people married our families from which I get my maiden name, Fernando. This is a very popular last name, although Fernando clan didn't convert to Christianity as much as others. I was born to a family that spoke the native language singular, but took on the learning of English that became my first language. Many of the island became Catholics and embraced those religious traditions, while others remained predominantly Buddhist. My mother was a Christian and my father was a Buddhist. Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, and is often referred to as the pearl drop as it looks like a teardrop at the bottom of the Indian subcontinent. The island attracted many Westerners to shop for our famous tea, cinnamon, and precious stories, stones along their journeys. Mm -hmm. A history of being under the Portuguese, Dutch, and British makes us a diverse nation that got its independence in 1948 from the British. After that, we are known as the Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. It's a beautiful tourist destination to enjoy the beach, the hills, country, or tea estates, and the historical monuments left behind by the ancient Sinhala kings that still stand testimony to the evolution of Buddhism. My mother kept a home that was like a museum with elegant collections of furniture designed by my dad, not as a profession, only as a hobby, and a garden that was well managed by the gardener. I loved standing in between the trees near the property wall to talk to neighbors who walked by and friends who came to play cricket or badminton. <clears throat> my mother's family was heavily influenced by the British and their tea parties with delicious savories of orders, tea sandwiches, of asparagus and cucumber, sweet cakes and strong black tea with the aroma of cardamoms is typical island style. I recently recall that a hot plate of food was delivered to my lunch uh, at the back of my school gate where I enjoyed eating with friends. Those were fun days of my life. Yes, I was spoiled. I could never do that for my kids in America as I was a working mom. They ate whatever I preferred for them mostly sandwiches of chicken nuggets or a chicken sa Sri Lankan savory or food from the school cafeteria. I had many after school activities that kept me engaged, practicing swimming, tennis, preparing for sports meets, dancing and elocution classes that perfected the speaking of the English language. Walking down the beach close to my home was also a frequent activity with friends. There was no TV or mobile phones to hang out. Only the radio that played Western music most of the time. The friendships I have built during my school days hold strong even today and keep me connected to my island where I was born. I have lived in America now twice the years I spent growing up in Sri Lanka and have learned to do many household chores, cooking, gardening, laundry, driving, and shoveling the snow. An experience well worth my time learning to live in the West in these amazing United States. It's been 43 years since I left my country. I don't visit frequently as I stayed focused on the opportunities that came my way. Today, I'm proud to be American. Reflecting on the words of this song, if tomorrow all the things were gone. I worked for all my life. And I had to start again. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. God bless America. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Anusha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
for your beautiful story. That's great. You know, I, I just, again, want to point out, here you've been taken to another world. This is the power of storytelling, that for those who have not visited Sri Lanka, we just got to take a little tour of the, the world through Anusha's eyes, through her experience. And she, she, brought us, she brought us there. And, and the other thing I want to point out when it comes to the technique that we study in class is you can see how beautifully folks are just confidently coming up here and standing and delivering their story. That doesn't come naturally to everyone. You know, it's for, I taught public speaking years ago and I will tell you it's one of the biggest fears people have is public speaking. So to come up and do this is yet another brave act. And they've been home rehearsing these stories, reading them aloud and preparing. And I just really want to honor the work that they've been doing. Uh, and, and let you see, let you see what went into this. And we're so glad that you're here. You know, I really want to give a shout out to all of you who came because stories are written to be heard. And by coming and supporting these storytellers, you're helping to close that loop. You are being the audience to receive these stories. So we appreciate you and uh, are, are so glad that you came. Okay, with that, I'm going to introduce our next storyteller and that's Al Feldman. Al is a retired physicist with more than 100 scientific publications. He now designs art quilts, and I will tell you they are magnificent, uh, using computer software. He, uh, he, and his quilts have been exhibited at national quilt shows and have won several awards. He published an article called Making Waves in Quilting Arts Magazine, which describes some of his quilts and how they are made. And with that, I give you Al. day with my father. My father, Harry, was a New York City taxi driver. He was born in an apartment on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. As a youth, he had a reputation as a daredevil, and he enjoyed the scariest rides in Coney Island. For many years, Coney Island, a section of Brooklyn, had many amusement park rides such as carousels, roller coasters, bumper cars, a parachute jump, and a wonder wheel. It was also a beach destination where people would come to swim in the Atlantic Ocean during hot summer days. My father never completed elementary school. Despite his brief formal education, he was self-taught and had many talents from which I learned a lot. Here are two examples. He taught me about, about electricity by constructing a circuit consisting of a battery, a bell, and a switch, which allowed me to ring the bell by tapping the switch. Next, he showed me how to develop film and to make contact prints from the negatives. When I was in my early 20s, he taught me to drive a manual shift car. He had many ways of entertaining children who were visiting us, such as showing old movies with a 16 millimeter projector. <coughs> During World War II, my father worked the night shift, so I rarely saw him because he would sleep during the day. However, on one particular day in 1944, when he was off from work, he took me to purchase a suit at the Basie's department store in Manhattan. I was eight years old at the time, we lived in, Williams, in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn, so we had to use the subway to get to Manhattan. However, we didn't go directly to Macy's, but made some diversionary stops instead. First, we went to a barber shop for my father to get a shave and a haircut. Getting a haircut was rather ironic as he was bald on the top of his head with a fringe of hair growing around the bald area. It seems that the barber was a jokester. He would fake cutting my father's throat. 
with a closed straight razor. I was neither amused nor taken in by this shenanigan. Next, my father took me to a bar where he had some drinks. At the time, he had gotten my mother a new wedding ring, so he was wearing her old ring on one of his fingers. I don't know what he planned to do with her old ring. However, the alcohol he had drunk caused his finger to swell, and so he was unable to remove it. Leaving me at the bar for a short while, he left to have the, the ring cut from his finger. I do not recall how I felt while he was away, but at this young age, I exhibited a degree of independence. For example, a year later, when I was nine, I was able to travel to my grandparents in Bayonne, New Jersey, all by myself, taking the subway and then a bus from the Dixie bus terminal. At, th at that time, the New York Port Authority bus terminal had not been built. Finally, late in the afternoon at around 5 p.m., we left to go to Macy's. As we tried to enter the store, a large stream of people were leaving it. It seems the store was closing because a hurricane was approaching the city. So we went home on the subway with no suit for me, which concluded the day with my father. As a child, not buying a suit was of no consequence to me, but this experience was evidence of a darker side of my father's personality, his susceptible to alcohol. My father's alcohol use greatly affected my mother, who would strongly react by screaming at him when she smelled liquor on his breath. I was exposed to the situation for a very young age, and I suspect it affected my personality and accelerated my maturation. In general, my father abstained from alcohol use, but he would relapse on occasion. The, cur the hurricane that caused the closing of Macy's and prevented me getting a suit arrived that night. The following day, I saw trees that had been uprooted stretching from one side of the street to the other, blocking all traffic. I have come to learn that the storm is called the 1944 Great Atlantic Hurricane. Its aftermath could be seen for many years. What Al does so so well in this story is he paints a portrait of his father that is a full-bodied portrait. So we often, when we write about people, we have a tendency to try to mythologize them and make them only show one side or another. Sometimes the mythology we have about a person in our life is that they only had dark qualities. Sometimes the mythology we have about a person is that they only had positive qualities. And what's so rich in this story is <coughs> that Al paints a picture of a full-bodied human being that has every type of quality. And, and, and that's, again, that that's, really takes craft and thought and bravery to present all sides. And it, what's, it's what makes the story so rich. So thank you, Al. Well, I have the privilege of reading one of our students' stories now. Um, Roz Feldman is seated right here, and Roz has asked me if I would read her story for her. Uh, first, let me introduce Roz, the author of this story. Uh, before retiring, Rosalind Feldman worked as a licensed psychotherapist at the Regional Institute for Children and Adolescents in Rockville, Maryland. Prior to that, she was an assistant professor of community health nursing at Catholic University, then at Georgetown University. Roz earned a PhD from Catholic University. Mm -hmm. She is motivated to complete her memoirs so that her three children, their spouses, her nieces, and 11 grandchildren will have them to read. And she is well on her way to doing that. Uh, before I read her story, I just want to give you a definition that may be helpful. Uh, because the story is a story of, of Raza's journey with Zionism. 
And I wanted to give you a definition of Zionism as she gave it to me, which is the movement working to assure that Israel thrives as the homeland of the Jewish people. It is a response to anti-Semitism. And Raz's story is Zionism and me. On February 23rd, 1939, I was two years and four months old. I remember overhearing my parents talking in the kitchen as I played nearby. My father was extremely upset, telling my mother about what he had encountered, stationed as a member of the New York City Police Force, responsible for arresting and transporting disorderly attendees in a, at a gathering in Manhattan. It was the German American Bund, which was a pro-Nazi German American organization of the 1930s. They had conducted a rally attended by more than 20,000 Nazi sympathizers at Madison Square Garden that day. Hearing about the incident and subsequent world events influenced my emotional and intellectual responses <coughs> to Jews' place in the world and how they are treated. By the time I was 12 years old in 1948, World War II had been over for three years. I was in the eighth grade at Herman Ritter Junior High School in the Bronx. It was time to decide which foreign language I would study. Hebrew had recently been added to the usual choices of Latin, French, and Spanish. Since I had studied Yiddish and knew the Hebrew alphabet, I choose, chose Hebrew. The high school teacher was Mr. Gilman, a balding, dark-haired, 50-ish, no-nonsense man whose humor involved confronting boys in the class who already had had their bar mitzvahs and evidently thought that studying Hebrew in public school would be a cinch. As a result, many of them showed a lack of interest in Mr. Gittleman's class presentations. However, it was in those <coughs> classes that I met girls who became my friends. Among them was Edith Drescher, who coincidentally lived on the next block from me on West Farms Road in a large apartment building similar to the one I lived in. One day at lunchtime, over the sandwiches we had brought home, Edith announced that her cousin Judy was organizing a group of girls for a Zionist organization called Hashomer Hatzer. That means the Young Guard. The group had been founded in Galicia, Austria, Hungary in 1913, and at the time I heard about it, and currently that has kibbutzim. Kibbutzim are collective farms in Israel, and they had youth movements throughout the world. I was drawn to it. My uncle Max had returned from fighting in the American infantry in Europe throughout World War II, and he told my family stories about liberating concentration camps. I was terribly sad about the six million dead Jews, among whom had been my mother's uncle and cousins in Austria, and the execution of millions of other innocents by Nazis. <coughs> Judy and her co-leader, Shlomo, both seniors in high school, became my leaders, leading our group in weekend meetings that included fun activities such as Israeli and other folk dancing, singing, talks about Zionism, and trips to interesting places in New York City. Growing up in that movement, the Zionist movement, as members referred to Hashomer Hatzair, for many of us, high school graduation ushered in a year of study in Israel. I was fortunate to attend the Institute for Youth Leaders from Abroad in 53 through 54, where students from Zionist youth movements throughout the world studied together in Jerusalem for eight months. Our small group representing Hashomer Hatzair spent, four months, uh, spent, uh, spent eight months on the kibbutz doing significant agricultural work and continued studying for another four months making day trips to historical sites throughout the country. It was interesting getting to know kibbutzniks from different countries. Soon after, I was asked, soon after returning, I was asked if I would be a youth leader in Montreal, Quebec. My parents were not happy about me delaying college, but eventually they agreed to allow me to work in Montreal it was interesting getting to know Canadian Zionists who were incredibly welcoming and kind. My friend Yona, whose parents invited me for frequent sleepovers, had immigrated to Montreal with her family from Poland. 
I still remember the huge feather pillows Yona's family had that reminded them of Poland when life was still possible for Jews there. Once summertime came, it was fun and challenging, leading a group of preteen girls through days and nights of summer camp in the Laurentian Mountains. Once camp for the youngsters was over, a special camp just for group leaders like me was held for a week in the Catskills of New York State. It was there that I first met the person I would marry years later after we both completed college. We've both remained devoted to the necessity of Israel as the Jewish homeland, reinforced by historical records going back to biblical times, which relay repeated vanquishing of Jews from nations not their own. The current success of protesters at universities opposing Israel's existence who have influenced university officials to cancel investments with firms doing business with or connected with Israel, along with hateful rhetoric and sometimes physical assaults on Jewish students, is another current cog in the historical pattern of anti-Semitism facing Jews. Ross, will you stand? Take it down. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much for the privilege of reading your story. And, you know, this too is, this is, again, you know, I talk over and over about the bravery it takes to write stories, to write stories about hard subjects, but subjects Here's a story that is so dear to Roz's heart, from her history to the present. And, and she tells us how this history of hers, of being a member of this youth organization, is what ultimately led her to Mary Al, one of our fellow <laughs> students. So thank you again, Roz. Thank you. And now I get to introduce Susan Ahern. She is a freelance writer and broadcast journalist. She mentors young journalists as the faculty advisor for the Montgomery County Student Newspaper in Rockville. She is a former elementary school media specialist and a New England native. Her first career was in radio news. She recently completed a podcasting class and she is raising a golden retriever puppy. Now, now that, yes, raising a puppy, awesome. Bring her on. Hello, uh, my story is called uh, Radio Days. I have a cold, so I'm going to be a little hard to um, hear. This is my story. My grandfather sold radios in the 1920s. My uncle was a radio engineer in high school at a local radio station for the Bob and Ray show but I never imagined that one day I would carry on that tradition. When I was growing up, my grandmother kept the radio on top of the refrigerator in the kitchen for better reception. I recall hearing the popular Arthur Godfrey variety show featuring guests like Irish singer Carmel Quinn and listening to a cooking show from Boston sponsored by King Arthur Flower. The programs were always on in the background whenever I was in the kitchen. When I was a teenager, I received a portable transistor radio, a very early version of what became a Sony Walkman. That meant I could listen to rock music that was popular in the 1960s. You could often hear music blaring from car windows when you came to a stoplight in the days before air conditioning. Or I could listen at night to announcers from faraway cities, often hundreds of miles from my home. I later became one of those voices in the night. When I was in high school, I wrote for the school paper. In college, I worked on the school newspaper as a writer and editor. I was majoring in English literature, but I didn't have a clear career path. One day, I heard an ad on the college radio station saying they were looking for students to write for radio. I walked down the basement hall of the student union building from the newspaper office to the radio station and entered a new world. I helped during the election night at the station and got to know the staff there. We all had to get a Federal Communications Commission license to make sure the station followed broadcast regulations. 
When I went to Boston at the old customs house to take the exam, I looked across the room and realized I was one of only two women sitting for the test. I knew I'd better pass because we had driven all the way from New Hampshire, and luckily I did. Eventually, I did noon newscasts and an occasional music show. It took a while to get comfortable on being on the air. I never planned to do what is called street reporting, but I finally agreed to work in the field as an election night reporter because the station was shorthanded, and the expectation was that everyone would assist on election night. <coughs> I was assigned to interview political figures at an election night headquarters in Concord, the state capital. I did my first election night interview and reported for a commercial news department as well as a student station. During that first interview and or doing that first interview and filing that report was thrilling. I liked it immediately. I spent election night searching for more people to interview and doing more and more live reports. I was hooked. I applied for newspaper and radio jobs in my senior year of college. I began my job search in January, sending letters to newspapers and radio stations around the country. We had no career office, so I had to do my own research to see if anyone would hire me now that I had the skills I needed to work in newspapers or radio stations. I went to work two days after I graduated from college at a small radio station in Western Massachusetts, anxious to start my career in radio news. Over the next two years, I worked in Ware and Worcester, Massachusetts, Providence, Rhode Island, Hartford, Connecticut, Philadelphia, and then back to New England to work in Manchester, New Hampshire. Later, when my family and I relocated to Maryland, I worked in Baltimore and then at a DC radio <coughs> station doing news. I was often the only woman on the air at the beginning of my career. Some radio station owners felt that listening to women was something that an audience wouldn't want to hear on the radio. Sometimes they had women only work at night when fewer people were listening. No one complained. We were just glad to get a job. I was qualified to work as a broadcast journalist, but I'm sure that I was hired for some of my radio jobs because it was a time of affirmative action. I was a young female applicant in a male-dominated industry. I had one boss who told me if I was disabled or a member of a minority community, they could meet all their affirmative action requirements in one person, me. <laughs> At that time, job listings were still done by gender in the newspaper want ads. When I was in college and applied for a summer job at a local radio station, I was told by the receptionist at the front desk, no, we don't hire women. Years later, I was hired to work there and ended up anchoring and reporting at the same station where I had done my first election night reports as a college student. I owe all those experiences to my decision to become involved in college radio. All my mentors were men who shared their knowledge of radio news with me in college and later supported my career. Today I'm the faculty advisor for an online student newspaper at Montgomery College in Rockville, paying back some of what was shared with me so many years ago. I've come full circle. A lot of radio broadcasting now focuses on podcasting, but I prefer live radio where you can hear things as they happen. I consider it a more personal experience. I miss the intimacy of speaking into a microphone and letting people know what is happening in their community. Witnessing historic events when you don't know the outcome until it happens, working all day, covering an election at night, and going back on the air in the morning. All part of radio news. I hope a new generation of journalists enjoys the work as much as I did. percent. Um, you know, other things that you heard in Susan's story, and we heard, we've heard elements of this in other stories as well, the humor, those little dabs of humor that just make the story pop. And, uh, you know, here she's taken us again into a whole other world that we, met, most of us know nothing about, the world, of the behind the scenes world of radio, but also from a woman's perspective at that time. And one of the things that she does so well in that story is share the emotions of how she feels about her work in radio. If she misses it, how much she loved it, how she's helping others carry on that tradition. So okay. one more round of applause. For so in five minutes, you can only get a very brief story. 
But what we can do is take that piece that you've just all each written and bring it home and expand it. You can fill in the details. Who was there at the party? How did you feel about it? What tastes? What did you eat? What kind of sounds? Was it noisy? Uh, what sort of gifts were involved? There are so many details that you can fill in. And so the idea is that we just got started here. And I wanted you to get to have an experience that writing doesn't have to be a big scary thing to do. And the other thing about it is that we talk a lot about the first draft is just, it's hard, you know, you just get it down. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be elegant. It's just getting us in the mode of starting to write. And that's what you all just tested out. So with that, I want to invite any of you that are interested in doing so to go to the front desk, register for the next series, which begins in mid-June. It will last for eight weeks with the ninth week in which we do a presentation like this. Again, the course is free. I do ask folks if they're signing up to plan to come to all the classes if possible. If you have to miss one or two, I understand. But the real value comes from attending each session. And if you can, spending a little bit of time at home it can just be a few minutes working on your stories. Uh, again, I want to uh, thank our tremendous writers. express my gratitude to Holiday Park and to Montgomery County Arts and Humanities Council for funding this course and to thank you all as our audience for coming and making it possible for us to share our work with you. So thank you.